Right, so we're on the back page there, and how was the Roman church state originally formed? That's the question we ask here on the screen. And the answer is that it worked through secular governments. It worked through what kind of governments? Secular governments. So notice right here in your study guide, the Roman church state has no standing army. It has always worked through existing secular governments to achieve its purposes. And so that's what you'd write in there on that line, secular governments. So the image of the beast will not be a literal image. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13 so we can get our fingers wrapped around this idea of the image of the beast. There are some people that have the anticipation that at the end of time there's going to be a literal image set up and that people will be compelled to worship a literal image such as we find in Daniel chapter 3. I think a closer examination of the text will reveal something a little different than that. Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, this is where we find the second beast coming up. We've already identified this second beast, and we begin in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the where, everyone? Out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but who did he speak like? spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And so the primary objective of the second beast is to cause the earth to worship the first beast. That's why he sometimes is called the false prophet. He's like a spokesperson for the first beast. Verse 13, he even performs signs and wonders so that he makes fire come down from men on earth in the sight of men. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. He deceives those who dwell on earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth, now notice this, to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and what? Lived. And so what happens here with the second beast is that his primary objective is to cause the earth to worship the first beast. And then it says that he even sets up this image of the beast. Look at that again there in verse 14. It says, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power, I'm in verse 15, to give breath. To give what, everyone? Breath. That's the New Testament word pneuma, that he would give his spirit or breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, the imagery here is actually very interesting, straight out of the book of Genesis. You remember that God said, see if you can remember this with me, God said, let us... Make man in our what? Image. And then after he made man in his image, the Bible says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That's exactly the imagery that you find here. Did everyone see that? Yes or no? It says that, that he, he creates this image and then he breathes into this thing. And so really what you find here is a counterfeit of what God did in the book of Genesis. So this, this figure, this form, this image is set up and then whoosh, he breathes into him his breath and this thing comes alive. We pick it up in verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell except him who has the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a what? Man. And what is that number? 666, or 666, that's exactly right. And so what we find here is that at the end of time, there's going to be an image of the beast. There's going to be a what, everyone? An image of the beast. Well, an image is a copy or a likeness. There will be a likeness of the beast or a copy of the beast. And notice it says that this image of the beast is created because the first beast had received a deadly wound. We see that in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, that he received a deadly wound and he began to go down, right? And as this beast was going down, that second beast was coming up. But then that second beast turns and whoosh, breathes breath back into that first beast. And here it comes again. An image to the beast is created right down to the end of time. We'll talk about that in a moment. Historically, we need to ask the question, how has the Roman church state functioned? And we've already said it worked through what kind of governments? Secular governments. Again, the Roman church state does not have a standing army in the same way that the United States has a standing army. They've always worked through secular governments, whether it was England or Italy or France or Germany. And so we're back to your study guide there. It says, so the image of the beast will not be a literal image. Rather, it will be the resurgence of the kind of power and influence the Roman church had in what times? In the Dark Ages. As the church worked historically through secular governments to achieve its ends, so too at the end of time, the resurrected beast will work through secular governments to achieve its ends. 
the United States will sadly play that very role. This is what the prophecy means in Revelation 13, 11 when it says, it will speak like a what? A, a dragon, and, and a dragon is who? Who is the dragon? That's the devil. And so what we're contending here is that we are seeing that deadly wound spoken of in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. We are seeing that deadly wound be healed right before our very eyes. When the most powerful rulers, the most powerful leaders, the most powerful governing officials attended that papal funeral, at least in the case of the United States of America, it was the first time in history that any president had ever attended a papal funeral. And here it wasn't just one, but it was the current president and two former presidents, not to mention many other prime ministers, ambassadors, all knew kneeling all what everyone kneeling not before God they're kneeling before the dead body of Pope John Paul who incidentally is just a sinner like every one of us in this room say amen if you believe that absolutely God loves Pope John Paul II no question about that but to kneel before him is is highly unusual and particularly highly unusual for the most powerful men and women in the government and so we're beginning to see this secular wound or pardon me this wound healing as the secular governments are aligning themselves more and more closely with this papal power we're, we're seeing this wound heal right before our very eyes now there are good Christian folk who want to make a change in the world. They see the moral decadence. They see the moral debauchery that's taking place. Unfortunately, many of these good Christian people are going to try and make a good change in the wrong way. Dr. James Dobson, any of you know this man here? Of course. Listen, I have a book in my, several books in my library that I love, Dare to Discipline, Bringing Up Boys. There's no question that the man has a special connection with Christ, particularly as it uh, relates to being able to communicate, uh, you know, great uh, counseling and psychological truths in a spiritual way. No question about that. My concern is that when good men like a James Dobson or a Ralph Reed or a Ted Haggard or a hundred others that could be cited, when these men get involved in politics as a mean to push their Christian agenda, I get a little nervous because I see the union of church and state coming closer and closer and closer together. And if we know anything from the old world experiments, church and state do not make good bed partners. If you believe that, say amen. That's why when the forefathers and foremothers came to this land, they said things like, we're going to be free from a king, and they set up civil liberty, and we're going to be free from the dictates of a pope, and they set up religious liberty. They said church and state would remain separate. Now, what that means is not that we don't want Christian people or moral people or good-natured people in governing offices, but that none of them should be enforcing or legislating their particular version or interpretation of the faith, whatever faith that is. A amen? And that's really the point. I'm back in your study guide here. Second paragraph. God made man in his own what? image then he breathed into him so to the image of the beast comes to life when the second beast breathes his power into the Roman church the image of the beast which looks just like the beast did in the dark ages will suddenly be, be, be brought back to life the United States will work with the Roman church to bring this nation quote back to God this seemingly noble experiment will climax and run amok when Sunday the mark of the Roman church's authority in religious matters is enforced, first with economic sanctions and then finally on pain of death. You say, do you really believe that's going to happen, Pastor Ashrick? I believe it with every fiber of my being, and not because I'm looking at the headlines, not because I'm looking at the newspapers, but because I'm looking at Revelation chapter 12 and 13 and 14. God has his seal, the beast has his mark. We ask the beast, what is your mark? He says the mark of our ecclesiastical authority is that we change the day of worship, the day of solemnity, from the biblical Sabbath to the Catholic Sunday. And that is going to be enforced. I believe that with every bit of my being, and I believe we are headed very rapidly in that direction. Now, you're th sitting there thinking, impossible. But I remind you again that already 36, what did I say, everyone? 36 states in this union already have Sunday laws. They are already on the books. These are not laws that have to be passed and written and legislated. These are laws that need to be enforced. What word did I say, everyone? Enforced. And you can do a little research on it. You can go to any Google search engine and type in Sunday blue laws and find out what comes up. The laws are already there. Now, 
Notice that it says that the deadly wound would heal. You say, how is this going to happen? How, how is this radical shifting of the paradigm here in America from religious protector and religious liberty and religious freedom to religious tyranny? It's going to happen as the Catholics are extending their arm to the Protestants. The Protestants, I'm talking about leadership here because God loves people, but he hates systems that, that are not consistent with his word. If you believe that, say amen. And so what we see is the Catholic leadership reaching out to the Protestants, the Protestants reaching out to the Catholics, and then both of them clasping hands and reaching out to the secular government. Okay? Now, I want you to notice this very interesting from the Washington Post, Monday, November 1st, 1999. This is not ancient history, beloved. Six years ago, and I want you to notice there the title of this headline news article. Lutherans and Catholics unite to what is that word? Heal 482-year-old division. Very interesting choice of words. Sounds exactly like Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, that his deadly wound would be what? Healed. And basically what happened is, this man here, a representative Christian Krauss from the representative of the Lutheran World Federation, sat down with this man here, Edward Casey, and they signed a document that said, in essence, the whole Protestant Reformation was a great, big misunderstanding. Well, I can just imagine that Martin Luther did somersaults in his grave hearing that. A misunderstanding? Sure. To the tune of 50 million, 60 million, 70 million, some say as high as 100 million people dead. Why? Because of a misunderstanding? You wish. It was more than a misunderstanding. Radically different systems. One says that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. And the other says you're saved by faith plus abiding by the traditions and sacraments of the church. These are radically different systems. The Reformation was not a mistake. It was genuine. It was real. And it was substantive. And the fact that people some 500 years later can sit down and write a document that says it was a mistake shows that, number one, they're not historians. And number two, they're driven by an agenda, not by truth. Very interesting, isn't it? These, these groups are rushing together. I just got this off of the internet today. This is just happening recently. First it was the Lutherans, some 100 million Lutherans, and now it's the Methodists. This is taken from Reuters News, News Agency, July 23rd, 06. Notice the title of the article, Historical Rift Mended. You could change that very easily to say, Historical Wound Healed. Notice. Greater harmony among Christians, a key goal of Pope Benedict's papacy, took a step forward on Sunday when Methodist churches joined a landmark agreement that has brought Catholics and Lutherans closer together. All that they're doing is joining on to that same document that the Lutherans had signed some six years before. The World Methodist Council, which represents about 70 million believers, signed on to the 1999 agreement resolving the main, look at this, resolving the main theological dispute that led to the 16th century Protestant Reformation and the splitting of West Western Christianity, oh, they solved it. There really was no difference between Protestants and Catholics. It's all been solved now. And so the Methodists can say, oh, we can come back home to the Mother Church. And the Lutherans say, oh, we'll come back home to the Mother Church. They've solved it? I'm sure that John and Charles Wesley are doing somersault circles and cartwheels in their graves thinking, what has happened to people? They don't know their Bibles anymore. And of course, in the case of Methodists, and if you're a Methodist today, I sincerely apologize, but I, I don't apologize for what I'm going to say. I just apologize for the fact that your church has so terrifically abandoned the faith. I mean, they're having huge councils to decide whether or not it's biblical to ordain openly homosexual ministers. Now, beloved, when you have left the Bible so far that you have to convene a council to decide if it's okay to ordain an openly homosexual minister, it, it's just a matter of time before you say, you know what? We don't have our way. We don't know our way anymore. We've lost our anchor. We've lost our direction. And so you're going to go back to the mother church. I mean, if you've, left, if you've left this thing and you're willing to say it with a straight face, you know what? We solved the whole problem of the Protestant Reformation. Whoop! It was all a big misunderstanding. That tells me you don't know your Bible. And not only do you not know your Bible, you don't know history. Amen. Protestant Reformation, it goes on to say, th the three parties, that is the Lutherans, the Methodists, and the Catholics, commit themselves to strive together for the deepening of their common understanding of justification. I mean, I'm just turning in my... Ah, oh, I can hardly believe it. Their common understanding of justification and theological study, teaching and preaching, the statement said. That was an official statement released by the Methodist Church. Notice that. A common understanding of justification. Now, for those of you who today are not theologians, justification means how you're saved. So let's just substitute that. A common understanding of how you're saved. 
Beloved, did John and Charles Wesley have a common understanding of how they were saved as compared to the popes and the Catholics and the prelates? No, I mean radically different, night and day, oil and water, up and down, forward and backwards, zig and zag. I mean, they, to say that these two are the same is like saying that black is white. You can say it all you want, but it's not true. And because you can get people who don't know their Bibles, who are biblically illiterate to sit down and sign a document that says it was all a mistake, does not prove that it was all a mistake. What it does prove is that you don't know your Bible and you don't know history and you're driven by, by a larger political agenda to unite the Christian world to get this nation and this world back to God despite the costs. But beloved, it is far, far, far better to be divided by truth than united by error. Now, we don't live in that world anymore. We live in a world where it's politically incorrect to suggest that somebody's wrong. But beloved, if you're going to stand on what the Bible says, your life is going to be a rebuke to people who would rather accommodate a political position and an agenda than stand for Jesus Christ and His end time truth. If what I'm saying makes sense, then I don't want you to say amen. Now look at this, just tonight somebody handed me this document here. It's dated um, November 30th. What, what's today? November 30th, and I'm reading here, it's an AP article, Istanbul, Turkey, Pope Benedict XVI called Divisions Among the Christian Church a Scandal to the World. Oh, whoa, 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 let's read that again. Today the Pope called divisions among the Christian church a scandal to the world. Do you know what he's saying is? He's saying that the church should not be divided. The church should not be what? He says it's a scandal. And of course, listen, I was one of those people that looked at Christianity and thought, wait a minute, you have one Lord, you have one baptism, you have one Bible, how come you have 1,300 different Christian denominations? I mean, that is confusing. Someone say amen. But God is not the author of confusion, and I'll tell you the solution is not running back to Rome. The solution is running back to the Bible. Someone say amen. amen. And so when the Pope says, when the Pope says, oh, it's a, div it's a scandal that the church is divided. Yeah, you're right. It is a scandal. But going back to the mother is not the solution. And you know what? What's happening when the Methodists come back into town with the Catholics and, and when the Lutherans, and again, we are talking about systems, not people. I want to say that again. Can someone say amen? amen. We're talking about systems, 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 systems. God loves Catholics. God loves Protestants. God loves... Muslims, God love atheists, God loves agnostics, God loves black, God loves white, God loves male, God loves female. Is that clear, everyone, yes or no? But the point is, is when the leadership of the Methodists come back to the Catholic Church and the leadership of the Lutherans come back to the Catholic Church, I'll give you one guess who's making the biggest concessions to bring about unity. You think the Catholics are saying, you know what, let us change all of the things we've been teaching for hundreds and thousands of years. You think they're doing that? You know who's making the concessions? The Protestants are making the concessions, beloved. Rome is not changing. Rome can't change. Rome has built into its doctrinal structure something called ex cathedra. And that is when the Pope speaks out of the cathedral, what he says is infallible. Now, beloved, if something is infallible, it can never be changed. And so when it comes time to start making concessions and start saying, well, you know, I guess we were wrong about that. The ones that are making the vast majority of changes and concessions are not the Catholics. It's the Protestant leadership. And so when the Pope stands up and says, hey, it's a scandal to the world that the church is divided. You know what you should be hearing? The churches should be united. Oh, but wait, if the churches are going to be united, we need a head. Well, who should that be? The article goes on. At a joint ceremony Thursday with the spiritual leader of the Orthodox Christian Church, which split from the Catholicism nearly a thousand years ago. Reaching out to the world's 250 million Orthodox Christian is a centerpiece of Benedict's papacy. He has set the difficult goal of full unity between the two ancient branches of Christianity. Look at that. Full unity, which divided over disputes, including the extent of papal authority. Last one here. The divisions which exist among the Christians are a scandal to the world, said the Pope after joining ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew I. Uh, to mark the feast days of St. Andrew, who uh, preached across Asia Minor and who believed to have ordained the first bishop of Constantinople, now Istanbul, etc., etc. So, we reached out to the Lutherans, got them. Reach out to the Methodists, got them. And now we're reaching out to who? The Orthodox. And while he was in Turkey, he made several steps to reach, several uh, uh, stops to reach out to the Muslims. Beloved, you're seeing a coming together, a convergence of religions. Uh, what did I say, everyone? a convergence or a coming together of religions, there's a technical term for this, and it's called ecumenism. 
ecumenism. Now, if you're sitting in here today and you're a Methodist, I hope you're not offended. I mean, if, if you're offended, you should not be offended at me. You should be offended at your church that has abandoned the Bible and refuses to stand for a plain thus saith the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. Don't be offended at the pastor. If you're sitting in here today as a Lutheran, you should be offended. But don't be offended by Pastor Ashrick. Be offended by your church's total abandonment of truth when it comes to justification. Oh, it was all a big mistake when Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the door at Wittenberg and the 100 million that died in the process, whoops, made a mistake. No! There is a mistake that's being made and that mistake is trying to gloss over and put a nice veneer over a huge theological difference between Catholicism and Protestantism, between traditions of man and biblical Christianity. Don't say they're the same. And you know what? I mean, you can already begin to see how it's going to look when someone stands up and says, it's a mockery. It's a lie. It's not biblical. It's not true. The emperor is naked. Oh, that person's going to be very popular, isn't he? Is that person going to be very popular? You know what he's going to be labeled? You're anti-unity. You're anti-unity. You're anti the truth. You, we're trying to bring everybody together and you're the bad guy. You're a terrorist. Beloved, are you seeing this? Yes or no? You'd have to be half asleep not to see it. We're going to continue on here. Look at this. All roads lead to Rome. Protestant churches are beating Rome's door down to be allowed back into the mother church. This phenomenon is called ecumenism and it is happening at an alarming rate. This coming together of the church and churches strengthens the Roman church's plans and potency. More on this in a future lesson, which we're actually combining, so there won't be any more than what you're getting tonight. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God's last day people will be forced to choose between forced worship and God's what? Commandments. In Daniel chapter 3, we find them standing strong by God's enabling grace, refusing to bow down to that great golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had constructed. May Jesus Christ grant us the grace, courage, and power to do the same. May we say with Peter, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. If you believe what I've said, I want you to say amen. amen. Now listen, don't, it's not because of me either. This book was released several years ago, Evangelicals and Catholics, toward a common mission written by two men, Charles Colson, a man who I have a great deal of respect for. No question about that. No question about that. But I'm concerned about the direction that some of these people are going when they start laying aside biblical truth for political expediency and agenda. It says here, Lutherans and Methodists have essentially abandoned the Reformation and aligned themselves with the Catholic Church. That's, a, that's just facts now. The Houston Chronicle reported on this book. In a sweeping declaration, evangelicals including, tell me if these names mean anything to you, Pat Robertson and Charles Colson. Never heard of them before, have you? Joined with conservative Roman Catholic leaders Tuesday in upholding the ties of faith that bind the nation's largest and most, what are these two words? Politically active religious groups. You see, there's an agenda. There's an agenda. They're not coming together because they want to get in bed together. They're coming together for a purpose. And you've heard this. There's no better way to get two uh, people that are at odds together than to have a common enemy. Isn't that true? Yes or no? And they say secularism is the common enemy. Moral decadence is the common enemy. And whatever you want to say is the common enemy. So people start uniting and they're not paying attention to truth. I was at a Promise Keepers rally one time, and, and I have nothing against the Promise Keepers. It's kind of faded, but I, I get a little concerned when you, you start having these radical political agendas that were taking place there. I was at a rally, some 20,000 people, and Max Lucado got up in front. He said to everybody, I want everybody to say their denomination on the count of three. And so one, two, three, and everybody says, you know, their denomination at one time. Presbyterian, Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, Catholic, Mormon, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's just blah, blah, blah. And he says, sounds like confusion to me. And everybody kind of laughed. Ah, 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 ah. And and then he said, uh, now on the count of three, I want everyone to say Jesus Christ. And then oh, one, two, three. And of course, it sounds so nice. Jesus Christ. And he says, that's the way it's supposed to be. And everybody, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. They're all cheering. But listen, beloved. Listen, listen, listen. We can say the words, but the question is, what do words mean? Does that make sense? Right? That's, uh, listen, if the devil gets a hold of language, the game is over. Does that make sense? We can, listen. My Jesus Christ is not the Jesus Christ of the Mormons. Can we be clear on that? Now, I can say the same word you're saying, but, but the Jesus Christ that I believe in is not the same Jesus Christ that the Mormons believe in because our picture of Jesus is informed by correct biblical teaching. Amen? Amen. I don't believe that Jesus Christ was the brother of Lucifer. I don't believe that he's one of a multiplied million spirit beings, blah, 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 nonsense. You can say Jesus Christ, and someone else can say Jesus Christ, and we can all say it together, and it sounds so good. But, beloved, if it's not biblical, it might sound good, but all you have to do is lift the hood and look underneath, and there's cancer under there. There's garbage under there. 
Does that make sense? And so, beloved, this is not, it's not going to work for us all just to get together in one room and raise our hands and say, Jesus Christ, and suddenly everything's okay, beloved. It has to be according to truth. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He didn't say, I'm a way. There are many ways, and I am one of the multitudinous ways. No, I'm a way, I'm a truth, and I'm a life. I'm the way, singular definite article. The truth, singular definite article, and the life. And so, yes, I do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but the only way that we can be sure that language has meaning and that we're saying the same thing is if we have some objective thing that tells us what that Jesus Christ is. Amen? Maybe you've heard people say this absolutely ridiculous thing, that, that it doesn't matter doctrine. Doctrine doesn't matter. Teaching doesn't matter. Only Jesus matters. Wait a minute. How do you know what Jesus is like? Do you believe that Jesus died, buried, and was rose again? Oh, I believe that. Well, that's doctrine, beloved. Amen? Do you believe Jesus was the Son of God? Oh, yeah, I believe. That's doctrine. It's one thing for us all to sound good and to sound unified and blah, blah, blah. But, beloved, we have to be unified on Christ and in Christ in truth. Mm. So here we are. Uh, where, did you, where do we go? Right here, back to this statement here from the Houston Chronicle. In the last generation, it has become common for evangelicals and Catholics to work together on issues such as pornography, vouchers for religious education, and voluntary prayer. Okay? So they come together for political means. What's different in the statement is the effort to turn the theological swords honed over centuries of conflict into a recognition of the what? Common faith. And that's the point. That's where this whole thing is going. The Archbishop of New York said this book is a giant step toward understanding not only our differences, but how common is our goal and how much we share theologically. And I can just see John Wesley, John Calvin, and Martin Luther just rolling in their graves. It is time that we caught up with the quiet conservative revolution that began a number of years ago in evangelical Catholic relations and help to advance it. Church and state will unite to enforce political uh, religious practices. Be crystal clear on it. The Bible says that's what's going to happen. And it's not going to happen because what we see in the news headlines is going to happen because that's what Revelation says is going to happen. Worship will be compor compul uh, compulsory. Worship will be enforced. And unfortunately, it's not going to be biblical worship. It's not going to be Bible-based worship. It's going to be based on the teachings of the mother church, which are not biblical. And so... People like myself who say, no, I'm going to stand on a plane, thus saith the Lord, and not the traditions and canons of men. I'm going to be put in a very awkward position when the laws of the land intersect the laws of God. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Whether we can't buy and sell or whether it causes pain. or I, it, Listen, beloved, it doesn't matter. I'll serve the Lord, I say with Joel, though he slays me, yet I will trust him. Now we're in the second study guide there. Let's talk about Babylon. How many, many people wonder why there are so many Christian denominations. How many people in this room have ever wondered, why are there so many Christian denominations? I'm going to tell you tonight why there are so many Christian denominations. This is a fair question. After all, there is just one Bible, one Savior, and one God. So it is difficult to understand why there should be so many different what? Churches. The purpose of this lesson will be to understand both the cause and the solution of this phenomenon. Let's begin by asking this question. How many churches did Jesus establish? I give you there Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. I'll just quote it for you quickly. Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're this or that. And Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up on behalf of the rest of the apostles. And he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he says something very fascinating. He says, You are Peter. You're a little rolling stone. But upon this Petra, this large monolithic unmovable rock, I will build my churches. No, 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 no. I will build my what? My church. And then he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against what? It. He didn't say them. He said it. Jesus established a single church. Amen? And I've given you other texts there. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that Jesus gave himself for the church. Not the churches. Today, there are many different flavors of Christianity. It's like going into a Baskin Robbins or into a Cold Stone. You know, what, what do you want? And you can find a church that fits your needs. You know, you can find a church that fits you just right. You say, you know, I don't really go for the double chocolate fudge and I don't really like the praline pecan, but mmm, coconut mint, give it to me. You know, you can have your own little flavor. 
He said, well, I don't really like the Presbyterians, and I'm not really a Methodist kind of guy. I'm more of a Pentecostal, right? We, we have, all of us have our little different flavors of Christianity, but beloved, 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 we've bought into a huge deception. Jesus established one church. And then he said the gates of hell won't prevail against what? It. We continue on here. Jesus established one church. This is an essential point to grasp. There are over 1,000 separate Christian denominations in the world today, yet Jesus established one church. What happened? Revelation holds the key. And, of course, the Catholics are going to say, well, I'll tell you what happened. You all left the mother church. Mm, that's not what happened. What happened is, is that people left the Bible. And you go to Revelation chapter 12. Let's go there together. Let's see if we can look at Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Here we see, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, a true church, God's true people. Now, I know some people say, well, this is, this is only Israel. Revelation chapter 12 is only Israel. Beloved, it's not only Israel. And we're going to spend a whole time on that when we get together on Saturday entitled, Who is Real Israel? The only reason you would think that this woman was only Israel was if you were based on a radical misinterpretation and misunderstanding of the book of Revelation that basically says, only up to Revelation chapter 3 is for the church, and everything after that is for Israel post-rapture. I mean, you have got to be kidding me, beloved. If ever there was an egregious, dangerous teaching, that's it. Because we're all just going, whoo-hoo, so glad I'm not going to be here when the mark of the beast crisis comes. High five, Psh, no antichrist, not going to be around. And even if I was, second chance, baby. Come on, beloved. The devil has pulled a fast one. The devil has pulled a huge fast one. I mean, are you, you really want to look me in the eye and tell me that Revelation chapters 5 to 22 has nothing to do with you? Are you kidding, beloved? So anyone who says, oh, this is only Israel, it's based on a huge misunderstanding, and we'll deal more with that on Saturday. It says, now a great sign appeared where, everyone? In heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. A woman in Bible prophecy represents what? A church or the true people of God. Now, I want you to notice she's clothed with three things. The sun, the moon, and the stars. You go back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And God ordained the sun, the moon, and the stars to bring light to this world. So this woman is clothed with light-giving things. Someone say amen. amen. So she will be bringing light to the earth. Isaiah said, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord will arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And so this woman, this true church who stands on the Bible, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This woman powerfully will be bringing light to a dark world. But there is another woman and she's in Revelation chapter 17. Go there with me if you would. Revelation chapter 17. Beginning in verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great what? Harlot. Harlot, some versions say whore, prostitute, who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed what, everyone? Fornication. So she has illicit relationships with the kings of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk through the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her what? Fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman. A woman in Bible prophecy is what, everyone? A church or God's people. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So, when we come to the book of Revelation, we don't find one church, even though Jesus had established just one, we find many churches. You say, many? I thought there was only two. No, look at there again. It says that her name is Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of what? Harlots. And harlots is plural, and so you have at least four women. Because you have the woman of Revelation 17, and she has at least two daughters, otherwise it wouldn't be in the plural. And then you have the woman of Revelation chapter 12. What, what John's trying to show you here is that there are many people at the end of time claiming to be God's bride. But you can be sure about this. God, is Jesus, is not a polygamist. Amen. He's not a polygamist. He has a single bride, and we'll pick that up there in our question, is Jesus a polygamist? One of our attendees came in tonight and said, oh, I've learned so much in these meetings, I don't think I could handle this one. <laughs> Beloved, we're not going to teach you that polygamy is okay. No such thing. Revelation chapter 12 depicts a chaste, beautiful, and virtuous woman. This woman represents God's true church, His faithful people. 
Remember, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. We've given you two texts there. Many others could be cited. In Revelation 17, we find an unfaithful, adulterous woman. The Bible calls a what? A harlot. In verses 1 to 5, she is accused three times of having committed adultery, adultery, adultery. She has numerous lovers who are themselves adulterous and unfaithful. Notice that there are many different women or churches here in Revelation. This is especially incredible when you remember that we have already learned that Jesus Christ established how many churches? One church prior to His ascension. So why do we have multiple women, multiple churches in the book of Revelation? Because the devil is muddying the waters. Because what did I say? The devil is muddying the waters. How many people here are converts to Christianity? In other words, you were not raised in a Christian home much. You are con con convert to Christianity. Okay, me too. Raise your hands nice and high. Okay, how many of you, you found it difficult to become a Christian because you said, well, where do I go? There's so many options. How many people found that confusing? Listen, that has to be one of the most confusing things in the whole Christian experience. And that's why John Paul says, or not John Paul, but pardon me, Benedict says, it's a scandal to the world. Well, sure, it is a scandal to the world. But the solution is not running back to Rome. The solution is running back to Bible truth. Amen? Amen? Amen. And, and by the way, I've got to just say this. Do not come up to me and say, that's just your interpretation. Beloved, that will drive me crazy. And it should drive you crazy, too. Maybe you've heard somebody say, well, you know, that's true for you and this is true for me. Beloved, 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 that is, an, that is an affrontery to the English language. Something is either true or it's not true. You know, I can't say, well, you know, 2 plus 2 is 7 for you and 2 plus 2 is 17 for me and that's true for you and this is true. No, 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 beloved. Something is either true or it's not true. Amen? Amen? Uh, don't, don't, don't think that you could just say, well, you know, that's Pastor Asherick's interpretation. Beloved, it's not about Pastor Asherick's interpretation. It's about what the Bible says. Amen? And I'm doing my best night by night to present to you what the Bible thinks. And that's why I say to you, hey, listen, if you show me where I'm in error from the Bible, from the what? The Bible. I'll, I'll stand up and tell you. I'll, I will stand up and say I was wrong about something. I have no problem with that. I just want to know what's true. Amen? And, you know, we're not out to, uh, you know, make fun, anything here. But when I say I'll give you $10,000, if you can show me where the Sabbath was changed, I'm not just whistling Dixie. I had a young man come up to me tonight, Al, and he says, hey, I think I've got your Sabbath thing here. I said, hey, listen, if, you, if, you, if your arguments are valid, I'll give you 10000 bucks. Beloved, we want to know what's truth. Amen? Amen? And so that's what's happening is that there's this, this, uh, uh, this movement, this movement that basically says we're going to unite upon error. And you have all of these different churches. And that's true for you, and this is true for me. You're a Methodist, and I'm a Presbyterian. You're a Baptist, and I'm a... Listen, beloved, we should be Christians standing on Bible truth. Amen. And if somebody wants to say, oh, well, you know, David's a member of a cult. Oh, listen, beloved, 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 the Bible says in Luke 6, 26, when it says Jesus was speaking, and he said, um, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Listen, you know what they said Jesus? They said Jesus was Beelzebub. You know what that means? The devil. So if Jesus could be called the devil, you can call me whatever you want. You can say cult, you can say crazy, you can say insane, you can say whatever you want to say. But if my conscience is clear that I'm standing on a plane, thus saith the Lord, you call me what you want. I'm just interested in what God thinks. Amen? Amen. And my father, my father said, oh, Lord, have mercy, because I was studying uh, medicine at the University of Wyoming, and I said, Dad, I just have to take some time off to think these things through. I'm going to become a Christian. He said, oh, I'm not so sure about that, and I'm going to start keeping this out. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. And my father loves me very much, but, but he was, you know, concerned, and so he was throwing out a few words there, you know, a cult, and, and be careful, and, and uh, you know, religious uh, intolerance, and extreme, and all of that. But, beloved... What my father thought, even though I love my dad with all of my heart, what my dad thought had to be secondary to what my heavenly father thought. Amen. Okay? So don't worry about what people are going to say. Your family says, you know, oh, you're going up to those meetings. Oh, they're talking about the Sabbath. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Listen, don't worry about what your family says. Worry about what your heavenly father says. Amen? Amen. Mm. We're going to go long tonight. I'm going to tell you that right now. A Babylonian bride. Bottom of that page. Revelation 17.5 tells us the name of this unfaithful woman, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. This reference to Babylon is an important one and we must not overlook it. We must not overlook it. Genesis chapter 11. Let's go there together. This is the first reference to Babylon. Very quickly, if you would, Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, and I'm reading beginning in verse 1. What verse, everyone? First book of the Bible, 11th chapter of that book, Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. 
Then they said to one another, Come, let us bake bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we should be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one and they shall have one language. And this is what they will begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come now, let us go down there and do what? confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called what? Babel, Babel or Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And this is the first reference we really have to Babel or to Babel. And the idea here is that, uh, skip that, skip that, let's keep going. Oh, the 666 thing, I got to come back to that, don't I? All right, all right. Let me just pick this thing up here very, very quickly. This idea of Babel or of Babylon is it has to do with confusion. Has to do with what? Confusion. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, God is not the author of what? Confusion. Very interesting, isn't it? And so here you have this confusion that's resulting. And at the end of time, it says this woman is called Mystery Babylon the Great. And Babylon stands for many things, a great many things. But one of the things that Babylon stands for is confusion is what everyone? Confusion. And that's why I said when, when I had you raise your hands and you looked out across the religious landscape just of the Christian world, it looked confusing. Amen, yes or no? I mean, it's totally confusing. But God is not the author of confusion. So who's responsible for creating this confusing situation? Well, beloved, it's not God. Amen? And I want to be clear about something. God has people in the Baptist church. If you believe that, say amen. God has faithful people in the Methodist church. God has faithful people in the Catholic Church. That's, God has faithful people in every denomination. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about systems. Somebody say amen. amen. No question. Now, I, I skipped over the 666 thing, and I want to cover this with you because I've told you I was going to do it twice in a row. Okay, let's just talk quickly about this idea of 666. It says there in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18 that he has this mysterious number, 666, and that it is the number of his name. The number of his, what everyone? Name. Name. And this is just a further identifier of this power. Now, it's very interesting that one of the titles of the Roman pontiff is Vicarious Philae Dei. That's in the Latin, one of the official titles. In fact, one of the best known official titles. Now, I know it's very interesting. You go on Wikipedia and you look this up, and the, uh, the, the church is actually trying to distance themselves, the Catholic Church trying to distance themselves from this title, but there is incredible documentation that from the time of the donation of Constantine, which is sometime around uh, 750 to 850 AD, this was a very, very common, well-known title of the Bishop of Rome. Now, the fact that they're trying to distance themselves from it today is not because it's not true, but because they've gotten a lot of grief over what I'm about ready to show you. And so this idea of vicarious philae day, it was a common practice in the days of Rome to take the Roman numerals and to add those Roman numerals up to equal a favorite number or a specific number, etc., etc. This is well-known, uh, numerology. In fact, our modern-day uh, numbering system uh, didn't come into uh, practical use until probably the better part, not, less than a thousand years ago, really. We started using our number one and our numeral two and our numeral three. It was always Roman numerals prior to that. Okay? So you take this official title here, one of the best known titles and probably one of the most presumptuous titles of the Roman church, uh, that is of the Roman pontiff, and that is Vicarious Philae Dei. That is Vicar of the Son of God. That's what it means, the Vicar of the Son of God. But I want you to think about this for just a moment. The word vicarious. How many of you have heard that word before, vicarious? For example, it's a theological term. If I say to you, Jesus paid the penalties for my sins vicariously. How many of you have heard that before? If I could say that, if I was preaching a sermon and I said, Beloved, Jesus paid the price for your sins. He died your death in a vicarious manner. Do you know what that means? It means he died as your substitute. He died as your what? Substitute. It comes from the Latin word vicarious, which means substitute. Substitute. Now, I want you to look at one of these official titles here. Vicarious Philae Dei. Dei is God, Philae is Son, Vicarious is substitute. Now, they use the term to sort of soften it as representative, but the Latin word is substitute. Substitute for the Son of God. 
That's very interesting. When you take those names, the numbers, the, those numbers, or pardon me, those uh, n uh, letters that actually have numerical value, you add them up and it comes up to get, what do you guess it would come up to? Exactly 666. So you take one of the most presumptuous titles of the Roman church, the representative of God on earth the substitute of God on earth, you add up all of the Roman numerals, 666. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, that it's the number of a man. The number of a what, everyone? Man. And it says, let him that has wisdom calculate. The Greek word literally means to add up and figure it out. Add it up. Figure it out. And it's right there. And by the way, you think, oh, Pastor Asterisk's so smart. He came up with this. Beloved, I didn't come up with this. Protestants were teaching this from 1616 and onward. Okay, this has been around for almost 500 years, 400 years, beloved, pardon me. 1616 and onward. Now, if you want documentation on that, I'd be glad, glad, glad to get you some documentation. But I don't want you to think, oh, this is something Pastor Asterisk invented. Not at all. One of the most presumptuous titles of the man of sin is the substitute for God's Son, and it's right there, 666. Incredible, beloved. And you can see why the Roman church would want to distance themselves from that title. Can you see that, yes or no? Sure, I mean, where, but where there's smoke, there's fire. Never forget that. Where there is smoke, there's fire. And so I'm asking you tonight, and I'm asking you every night, you're going to have to make a choice between Rome and Christ, and what are you going to choose? Someone's bound to say, well, I'm learning so much in these seminars, I don't know what's true. I had one person say to me, I'm going to read the whole Bible all the way through and then I'll decide. Let me tell you something. God allowed this truth to come into your life right now before you had read the whole Bible. Does that make sense? Don't think that you have to go back to school and get a Ph.D. or a Th.D. or any sort of degree before you can follow Bible truth. Jesus said, except you become as little children, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. It does not take a rocket scientist to figure out the basics of what we're telling you in these meetings, and that is this. There's going to be a division between the commandments of God and the commandments of the church, and God's true people are going to stand for the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Is that confusing to anyone? Hopefully that's not confusing. And so don't think that you can wait. Oh, I'm going to put it off until I understand all these things better. Beloved, God allowed these things to come to you right now. And God has the expectation that when he reveals truth to you, you will walk in the truth that he has revealed to you. Amen. Some people say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about this. I'm going to wait it out and see how it goes. Beloved, it's never safe to wait. Amen. Amen? Amen. I mean, you, it is never safe to delay. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Never forget that. Delayed obedience is disobedience. It is never safe to disobey one command of God. Can you say amen? amen. Absolutely. And we could spend even more time on that. But let's get back here to this uh, idea of who this woman is. I want to get right straight to the heart of this issue before the, uh, this evening's meeting is up. Um, it says there, I'm on uh, second page. Okay? We looked at Genesis chapter 11. We read that verse. The Tower of Babel was Genesis chapter 11. It was basically a center of man-made religion. Genesis 11, 9. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. Many scholars have said, well, they were going to build a tower to reach up into the heavens and that tower that would reach up into the heavens would, uh, uh, if, in case God ever destroyed the earth by a flood again, then what would happen is they could basically save themselves. That was what the thinking was. And so this becomes a classic example of salvation by works. Salvation by what, everyone? Works. We will save ourselves. And God says, confusion. And so confusion comes. Babel represents confusion. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30, we find uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He's looking out over his vast estate there in Babylon. And it says, the king spoke and saying, is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, he was stricken at that moment with a terrible disease called lysanthropic insanity where he had to go out in the field for seven years and he thought he was a beast. So Babylon represents not just confusion, Babylon represents to the glory of man. To the glory of what? Man. Is this not great Babylon that I have built for my royal dwelling, for my, my, my? Who does that sound like, by the way? It sounds like Satan, doesn't it? I will exalt and I will be and I, I, I. And of course, Satan is the one that's right behind this great Babylonian enterprise. Never forget, we've already told you in Revelation, you have that counterfeit motif. God has a woman, Satan has a woman. God has a city, Satan has a city. God has a trinity, Satan has a trinity. I mean, you go right down the list, counterfeit after counterfeit after counterfeit after counterfeit. Okay? And so, let's just take a very quick look here at Babylon the Great. It is a man-made system of religion. 
Okay, that's what it is. They were going to build that tower. You'd write that right there on your study guide. A man-made system of religion. Here we are. This is taken from Wary's Church History. Page 54. Christianity had now become popular. Look at this. This is talking about the 3rd and 4th century. Christianity had now become popular, and a large proportion, perhaps a large majority of those who embraced it, only assumed the what? The name. They were as much heathen as they were before. Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a what? Flood. Beloved, never forget this. Just because Christianity is popular, that does not mean that good things are happening. Amen. Cancers also grow very rapidly. <laughs> Okay? Rapid growth is not necessarily an indication of something that's good. Okay? And so what happened is, is that Constantine wanted to broaden his wings and invite all of the pagans to come in as well. Well, all the pagans start coming in. There's a problem. They didn't leave their paganism at the door. They brought their paganism into the church. And so this new religion, this new popular religion, became popular, but people weren't leaving behind a lifestyle. They weren't letting the old man be crucified with Christ. They were just saying, I'm now a Christian, but they hadn't left anything behind and they hadn't added anything new. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Beloved, that's happening in churches today. You put rock and roll bands up in front and you call it Christian rock. Like, yeah, we're rocking out for Jesus. Here's our Christian movie festival. We have a Christian pizza party and Christian this and Christian that. Beloved, listen to me very carefully. Just because you have people in a building does not mean you have Christ in people. Amen. Amen? Amen. You can get all kinds of people in a building, but the question is, do you have Christ in people? Okay, and some people say, well, what's wrong with Christian rock? I mean, what's the problem? Listen, let me just say something about that. Just adding the word Christian to something does not make it Christian. Can you imagine if I said to you, hey, listen, I got this incredible magazine. You got to check it out. It's the new Christian pornography magazine. You're going to love it. All, it's, it's done totally to the glory of God. I mean, all of the, the actors are Christians. Like this lady here, she's a Christian. And this guy here, these, the, oh, it's a Christian pornography. You'd say, what? Christian pornography? That's a contradiction in terms. So adding the word Christian to something doesn't make it Christian. Amen. What if I said, oh, man, I got, I got the good stuff. It's Christian marijuana. <laughs> Woo! Let me tell you, the Spirit has blessed this stuff. And, and the guy that owns it, I mean, let me tell you, everybody that works in his fields, they're all Christians. He pays tithe on what he, I mean, this is the good, they, they anoint their fields. And, uh, oh, you got to smoke out. I mean, this is some, you'd say, what? Is this guy insane? Christian pornography, Christian marijuana? Beloved, calling something Christian doesn't make it Christian. You can call it Christian rock and roll, doesn't make it Christian, amen? amen. Okay, so you got, well, we're rocking out for Jesus. No, you're rocking out is what you're doing. <laughs> amen. amen. You're rocking out. And the fact that you can get a bunch of young people to a rock concert, well, surprise, surprise. It's not difficult to get young people to go to rock concerts. What is difficult is to have young people turn their backs on the attractions and distractions of this world and make a firm decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's, a, that's a horse of a different color. Now, I'm not down on creative ministry, and I'm not saying everything has to be done exactly my way, but what I am saying is there's a huge difference between something being branded as Christianity and something actually being Christian. Amen? Amen? And I'm not going to stand up here and make a set of rules and say, yeah, this is in and this is out and this is in and this is out. God has given you a brain in the same way he's given me a brain. Amen. And I'm responsible to God for my choices and you're responsible to God for your choices. But ultimately, not everything that is called Christian is Christian. And if that makes sense, say amen. That's what was happening in the third and fourth centuries. Look, at Christianity had now become what? Popular. WWJD. What would Jesus do? Woo! A large proportion, though, perhaps a large majority of those who embraced it only assumed the what? Name, they were as much what? Heathen as they were before. Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a flood. This is history, beloved. This is history. Very quickly here, Babylon the Great is a center of image worship. Image worship. Dr. Alexander Hislop in his marvelous book, The Two Babylons, said, Babylon was the primal source from which all of these systems of idolatry flowed. Every stream of idolatry that exists today found its, its uh, 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 watershed, its fountain, its, its origin, or original streams in Babylon. Okay, there are, and there's examples of this incidentally. You can go to Rome today, you can go to the Vatican today, and there are statues of Jesus in Rome that existed before Jesus was incarnate. 
You say, how is that possible? Did they know he was coming? No, these statues were to pagan gods and pagan goddesses. And then when the Romans became Christian, they said, well, you know, this is such a pretty statue. I mean, we don't really want to throw it out. Oh, well, I got a great idea. We'll take this Christian statue of Samaramis and her little baby, and we'll say, oh, it's, uh, it's, G it's Mary and Jesus. And they just start putting Christian stickers on everything. Beloved, calling something Christian doesn't make it Christian. If that makes sense, say amen. But this is what's happening. This is absolute history. Look at this from John Cardinal Henry Newman, uh, Development of Christian Doctrine. We are told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion, what kind of religion? What new religion do you think he's talking about? Christianity. That's right. That's exactly right. To recommend Christianity to all the heathen, transferred into Christianity all the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own religion. You see, he just basically widened Christianity real wide, and he said, yeah, you'd all just come in, join the party, and you can be Christians too. But they were Christians only in name, and that's the point. The use of temples, those dedicated to particular saints, incense, candles, holy water, processions, the ring in marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, all are of what? Pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the what? Church. Yeah, just bring it all in. Come on in. It's a great big party. And the church was happy because it looked like evangelism. Looked like what, everyone? Evangelism. The problem was is that the heathen were coming into the church not for the purposes of conversion, but for the purposes of political expediency. For the purposes of uniting Constantine's kingdom. And Constantine looked out and he had about, you know, I don't know, 80% that were, you know, your run-of-the-mill pagans and the other 20% that were Christians. They were constantly in conflict. And he said, hey, can't we all get along? He supposedly had a vision of the cross. He lined a bunch of his soldiers up along a river. He marched them all through the river and he said, now you're baptized. They were all baptized because they'd marched through a river. Okay, what was happening was is that Christianity was basically being overtaken by paganism. And you had this weird amalgamation, half paganism, half Christianity, and you put a big stamp on it and you call it evangelism. Mm. Babylon the Great is also the, false, the center of false teachings about death. About what, everyone? Death. The pagan doctrine of the immortality of the human soul crept into the back door of the church in the early ages, said the watchman in April 1940. I just don't know how I can say this more plainly. Immortality is something that God gives you as a gift, not something that you possess innately. If that makes sense, say amen. The idea that you are naturally immortal is a pagan teaching or a pagan doctrine. It comes from the Babylonians and the Egyptians and others. Look at this sermon by Amos Phelps, absolutely remarkable. His sermon was entitled, Is Man by Nature Immortal? And I love this quotation, just too good to leave out. This doctrine, that is the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, can be traced through the muddy channels of a corrupted Christianity, a perverted Judaism, a pagan philosophy, a superstitious idolatry to the great instigator of mischief in the Garden of Eden. The Protestants borrowed it from the Catholics, the Catholics borrowed it from the Pharisees, the Pharisees from the pagans, and the pagans from the old serpent who first preached the doctrine amid the lowly bowels of paradise to an audience all too willing to hear and heed the new fascinating theology, you shall not, what? Surely die. In other words, he's saying, where did this all come from? I'll tell you where it came from, beloved. It came from the serpent who passed it on to paganism, who passed it on to Judaism, who passed it on to Catholicism, who's passed it on to Protestantism. The Bible teaching is this, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have the opposite of perishing, everlasting life. Immortality is a gift that God gives you when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen? 